Now, if you're from May or Donegal, it's the week you've all been waiting for. A summer of Sundays accumulates to this one day in Croke Park. The scramble for one of these will go on until the ball is thrown in, such as the demand for tickets across the country. Assuming we don't have a draw, Sam Maguire will have a new residence for the next 12 months. The question is, will he be crossing the Shannon to Mayo or taking a trip up to the hills of Donegal? We're going to talk about the game in, in detail uh, later, lads. But I was just thinking, Paul, during the week, this is a game that has the vast majority of these players have never played in an All-Ireland football final before. What's it like, the build-up for a player for his first All-Ireland final? Yeah, I know... Um that's key for these guys, I think, this week, you know, and like the game, the game won't be lost this week in the build-up, or it won't be won this week in the build-up, but it could be lost, you know, if you don't, mm. if you don't prepare yourself properly. And uh, personally, I always enjoyed it. I have to say, I always enjoyed the build-up because I, I felt that that's why you're do, that's why you're doing what you do, and that's why you're playing, and that's what you train for. So I always enjoyed it. I used to take myself away, you know, for for a few hours in every day that of the week of the build-up and. Just to gather my thoughts, you know, I'd go to Ballygarry House over the road from me and, and just go into their little little, little re relaxation room there that I used to spend a few hours and just to just to be on my own and gather yeah. my thoughts. But it should be a, a really enjoyable time for the lads, you know. Can anything prepare you, Paul, for coming out that dressing room door, turning right or left, trotting down the corridor, and then turning right or left out onto that magnificent arena that is Croke Park and the din and the noise? Can anything prepare you? Yeah, it's 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 an experience, and I think I think you know. At first, it can it can be daunting, but I suppose it, it can reveal, I suppose, what a player is made of uh, ultimately. Oh. And if if you're going to be a, a big player, you'll enjoy that environment. And, and if it's too big for you, you'll probably be found out up there, you know. So, um, yeah, I can remember a couple of occasions for sure where, you know, you'd look around you and you think like you're just being hit by waves and eyes. And it's you know it's a big it's a great experience though. And I think you know the big players on Sunday will stand up to that kind of atmosphere, you know. Jason, as a manager, both of these teams, uh, Mayo and Donegal, have bought into their manager's way of thinking. How difficult is it for a manager to achieve that? I suppose they definitely they've they've gotten the you know the players believe in both managers. They've shown that, but they've you know personalities of the managers. They've imposed it on the players. They've um, you know they're they they believe in the group of players. I suppose the, the fact that they show belief in the players, they show faith in how they play, they show faith in in the, the qualities that the players bring. Um, the managers are, they don't, they don't, neither of them seem to leave any stone unturned as to mm. what they're going to do. Even, even I suppose in the build-up to this game, that they have been so calculated over their two years that the board have been in place that you'd imagine that in the lead-up to the game, they'll have everything, they'll have the list of what needs to be dealt with, how the players need to be addressed, what, what, what things are going to affect the players and they'll be, they'll be going through them one by one by one by one. And that, because they're so meticulous in what they do, by the time you know today is Thursday, everything we dealt with and it'll be a case of um, bring on the game. We'll see the results on Sunday in terms of the preparation. Colm, you're an experienced journalist. You've seen lots of All-Ireland finals. Have you experienced anything like the level of excitement for this All-Ireland final? No, Marty, I, I haven't. I thought last year with Dublin and Kerry, the renewal of that mm. rivalry and 16 years Dublin out back into an All-Ireland final and everything around that, I didn't think it could probably surpass that. But it has. The interest in this is really phenomenal. And f for once, it's not Mayo alone who's engulfed by the hype. It's really Donegal. And they're sitting there for the last three and a half, almost four weeks now since they won their semi-final. And it's a little bit dangerous for them. Oh. There's a lot of very excited people up there. <laughs> the sense of expectation after beating so many previous All-Ireland champions is palpable. And even the sense that this is their destiny now is, is very, very dangerous for them. And I think Mayo have had almost a perfect build-up for them. Normally it's them who become submerged mm -hmm. in hype and expectation. They seem to have handled it very, very well. It'd be very difficult for the Donegal players to insulate themselves from that. Very, very difficult. Jim McGuinness will surely do a good job, but these guys are only human. Is that a factor, Paul? I mean, Mayo seem to be more composed. Their fans seem to be more composed, where Donegal seems to be gone half mad. Yeah, it can be a factor for sure. It depends on, on the character of the player again, I think. But... Uh, I happened to be in Mayo last weekend and, and there's a really low-key build-up in Mayo at the moment which, which I think augurs well for them uh, at the weekend because, like I was saying earlier, you know, that kind of a build-up can affect the player, especially if he's inexperienced, you know, so, um, 
yeah, it counts. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot more about this All-Ireland final, but uh, we're, well, one man who unfortunately won't be present this Sunday will be missed from the terraces is journalist Con Houlihan, who passed away recently. Con had a unique way of bringing a game to life for those who enjoyed reading him. Fellow Kerryman Billy Keane will be thinking of him this Sunday. Kerry won't be in the All-Ireland next Sunday, and we're sad about that. But we mourn for someone else too, someone bigger than Kerry. We still have his writing to remember him by, but Con Houlihan won't be there either. We come here on the Monday after the All-Ireland, like we always did. Con was always first in, big framed, a joint of a man, and we'd all be there to pay homage to him, carry footballers, dubs, because he was part of Dublin too. And that'd be the great day. We'll be back too, next Monday, after this All-Ireland, and we'll remember him then. But we always have his one-liners. One of my favorites of those great one-liners was was on a day when uh, Kerry scored a goal against Dublin. And all danger for Dublin there. The ball breaking loose on the wing. It's a goal! It's a goal by Johnny Egan! And Con said Hill 16 was as quiet as Knock Nagashal on a Good Friday. There were many more. Kerry against Dublin again. This one was in 1978. And Con wrote about poor Petty Cullen. If a man who fishes for salmon with a steak net had seen his cordage dance as often as Paddy Cullen did in this astonishing All-Ireland final, he would have been very happy with his day's work. But there is an immensity of difference between bending to take out a salmon and stooping to pick up a ball that has got past you. And what happened, Con, when a free was given against Paddy Cullen that same day? Mikey Sheehy was running up to take the kick, and suddenly, Paddy dashed back towards his goal like a woman who smells a cake burning. The ball won the race, and it curled inside the near post as Paddy crashed into the outside of the net and lay against it like a fireman who had returned to find his station ablaze. Could anyone else ever hope to put it any better? He wrote, not long before he passed on. My hot water was in the Glauncheroon River. It is almost 25 years since I fished that river, and I can still remember all the runs and the pools and the shallows and depths and the places where trout love to run and the places that they shun. And as he slipped away, the boggy brown waters of the Glauncheroon went coursing round and in and out through the four posts of his hospital bed. And overhead, the Skylark sang a requiem for Con Houlihan, bog lover and fisherman, who cast his spells well beyond the banks of the Glauncheroon River. We brought him home, that big man in a small box, and laid him with his mother and father in Castle Island. Welcome home, Con. Welcome home. Mi veg a lehead aun arish. Lovely words there from Billy. Paul, as a young man growing up in, in Kerry, were you aware of Con? I was, yeah, I was. I, I, um, I actually, as a young fellow, I used to read him a lot. I used to read his writing a lot, and I was given a present by, by an aunt, my aunt Nula. Uh, who gave me a book of his called More Than a Game. There was a, a collection of sporting essays that mm. I still reference now and again. And I just loved the, the integrity to his writing and, and, and it, it was just very authentic. And there was a real sense of, even though he wrote about the soccer, World Cups and rugby, and there was always a sense of parish about what he wrote as well, you know. Mm. And like that, Nor Kerry has a really rich literary heritage that I've always been very proud of, you know. And like 
no more than Billy there as well. Like Billy, Billy is a fantastic writer, a colleague of Cullum's in, 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 in the Independent, and Cullum would know more about Khan's craft now than, than I would, of course. But um, I just thought for Khan it was more about the craft of writing than, than even the game, you know. Mm. And uh, like I say, he's still a, a writer more so than a journalist in my, in my eyes, you know. Absolutely. Jason, uh, you know, he, he was different, wasn't he? Absolutely, I suppose. Even Billy there in the, in the comments made he, his language. He, he spoke. Um, he was unique in, in, in the words that he used and the phrases that he that he coined. You know, and, mm. and that's that's something that will be missed. That um, there's not as much of that uniqueness around anymore. Colm, uh, I'm sure if Con was with us as a Kerry man, he'd be happier if Kerry were in the All Ireland final. But he'd be really excited about two newcomers to coming to Cook Park. Of course he would. I mean, probably no sports journalist engaged more with people, more than mm. Con, where he positioned himself on the canal end for games and uh, his regular posting in Mulligans after a game and mm. the following day also. So he really engaged with the people. Uh, a lot of people identified with him. And uh, I suppose uh, he was unique in the his position on the back page of the evening press was just so constant through all the years. Uh, that was it. No sports journalist has remained in, in situ in, in a position on a, on, a, on a page for so long. So uh, he, he mixed nature and sport, blended it so well together in his pieces. Wonderful journalist. And tonight we're thinking of Con. Now we'll be talking more about that game on Sunday in a few minutes. But no one in Mayo needs reminding that they haven't won the All-Ireland since 1951. The captain of that team was Sean Flanagan, who went on to become a prominent politician and government minister. His son, however, was reared on stories of football. The boys of the Arcane Band, Mayo with Sean Flanagan proudly leading his men of the West. We were always aware that our father was uh, somebody who was in, in his own way unique. He also had a strong political background as well, but for us growing up, Mayo football was number one. Politics was number two. 50-51 was his time to be given the leadership role. He already had the leadership in any event on the field. He recognised what a unique group of players they had and what a unique opportunity that he saw for the group of players. And they seized the moment. That team, for up to two weeks, they would stay in what was, I think, known as Gohan's Hotel in Ballina, and they would train every day together and work on tactics. I think it was unheard of. But I would say, as far as Sean Flanagan was concerned, this was the proper way to prepare for an All-Ireland final. From the mountains and crags, the plains and the valleys, they've come to see the game of the year. And what a glorious scene it is as we look down on the 78,201 people who have come to see the Battle of the M's. M for Mayo, M for me. Sean was giving a fairly fiery pre-match speech to the team when he was interrupted to be informed that the Meath team would not be able to get onto the field from their own dressing room and would have to pass through the Mayo dressing room before they went onto the field and Sean instructed the Mayo players under no circumstances to acknowledge or make any eye contact with the Mead players as they passed through the dressing room. And it was reported to be a quite eerie that as the Mead players sauntered through, they were met with stony faces. I don't believe there were any rows coming out of the tunnel, no. They, uh, when you see the clips of the game, there was enough physical confrontation in the game in any event. The teams themselves, Mayo wearing the white of Connacht and Mead, the green of Leinster. And so to the throw-in and the battle for the 1951 title is on. Mayo break away from the start, but despite their efforts, me are the team in the early stages. One standout moment is Tom Langan's goal. The moment he gets possession, he turns, he gets space, and he drops the ball onto his foot, and there's a tremendous curve on the ball as it hits the back of the net with tremendous force and precision. And Tom Langan used to practice. Even the night before a game, he'd roll up a newspaper ball and practice hitting the ball through the door of his bedroom. People would be talking about uh, technique, angle, power, everything coming together. A huge man, perfectly balanced, striking for goal. It's an amazing goal. This team had an ability to, to get goals. 
and even in games where they were well behind, they managed to recover. A strong me the attack is repelled by Sean Flanagan as Dixon passes to Sean Mulderig. He gets the ball through to Joe Gilvari and he sends through his goal to make the halftime score. Mayo, two goals and three points. Mead, eight points. The second goal gave Mayo the platform and they didn't lose that lead for the rest of the game. Mayo take up the attack once more for Joe Gilvari despite the attentions of the back to send over the bar. It's homeward bound for hundreds now, even before the final whistle. And when this does go, it's a signal for the crowds to surge onto the field. 51 was the pinnacle of that team in their performance, in everything that they sought to achieve. When on the Hogan stand, Mr. Vin Sean Flanagan would want this current Mayo team to make their own history and to make their own place in the history of Mayo football. Great pictures of 1951 there, and that footage is held in the IFI Irish Film Archive, and it is actually available to buy now as part of a DVD box set called GA Gold, which you can get on their website, www.ifi.ie, and well worth a look. OK, let's talk about the All-Ireland Football Final. Paul, you played against Donegal in the quarterfinal. What impressed you about them? Um, first of all, I think from the off, I think they're... they're they're a team that are quite methodical in their in their preparation for games. Like they they pulled a few strokes on us now uh, from a tactical point of view before the game that it took us took us fifteen or twenty minutes to figure out what was going on, particularly on kickouts. You know, so they're like what they're exactly? Clever. Well, we had expected them to do X on kickouts. They did Y on kickouts. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that really threw us. It, it threw me in particular because that I kind of play role. around the kickout. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. it took me. I had to think in my feet for ten minutes. So from that point of view, they're already ahead here. You know, mm. so, and I, th I think going into Sunday, like you can. This game almost has to be won before you take the field. You know, I often think that with All Ireland finals, you know, you need to you need something new. You need to pull the rug a little bit from from the opposition. You know, yeah. so um, I mean, look, I mean, overall, everyone is talking about their their system and their and their their um, their work rate, but I mean, they have a lot of quality. They have, yeah. they have a lot of quality players. Donegal have you know. Um, uh, as Paul says, uh, Colm, you know, the, the, a lot of talk about Donegal style, but when you analyse them in in detail. Both Mayo and Donegal play a similar style of football. Yeah, they do, and uh, the, obviously predicated a lot on defence, and mm. that's how Jim McGuinness set out at the start at the start of the year, uh, at the start of his term last year, uh, build a strong defence, and they got that. Their rate of improvement in the second year has been quite staggering to my mind. Mm. A new manager will come in and bring a team so far with better fitness and better organisation, but tactically. Uh, how they have evolved with their attacking play from the Dublin game last year to what they did against Cork. And you must remember they were five points ahead of Cork, six points before Cork got the goal at the end to mm. bring some respectability back to it. And it's similar, amazing. Similar enough to our, exactly. to our game, yeah. And actually, the, the three goals that they have conceded have all been in the last quarter of games when they've been well ahead. Yeah. The only time they've been really challenged coming down the line is was against Tyrone. And even then they had a considerable lead going into, the say, the last ten minutes. But the... Mayo have a, the difference for Mayo in this match and the previous All-Ireland Finals in 2004 that in mm. 2006 that some of these players lost is that Kerry exploded out of the blocks yeah. on both occasions. This time they're playing a Donegal team that starts slowly and builds momentum. So I don't think there's any real danger of anything like that happening yeah. with Mayo. There's a harder edge about them. They're more cynical in the way they set up defensively and I, I think they'll be right in touch into those right down that final straight. Jason, if you were the Mayo manager... Would you have gone back and asked Conor Mortimer to rejoin the squad for this All-Ireland final? At this stage in the year? Mm. Absolutely not. The, the, players have, this, the players seem to have united even more with the, with the changes in bow camps. That, is it any coincidence that you know, Kevin Cassidy and Conor Mortimer, the panels, that the players seem to be... You know, they're, they're, you know, the performances have shown how united they are, that Mayo even though Dublin were coming back at them the last day, they, they stuck at it, they had a belief to stay, and, and, and they did enough to, to get over the line. Donegal have had some games where they've started very well, other games where they've maybe struggled for a while, and, and just they seem to just get into the rhythm, and all of a sudden they're hard to catch, but they've, they've great belief. Like Both groups have great belief, but there's, uh, I, I wouldn't have thought, thought at any stage that James would have considered you know, you know, going yeah. back. Um, decision is made, 
you get on with the year and, and well, there you might work. have been a case but after Andy Moran got his injury to go back to Connor and James Horan would have been in a position of strength then to say look Connor the option is yours you know you're part of a squad not part of a team maybe, maybe. And perhaps at that point he's he's a great scorer he's a good yeah. finisher whatever else people will say about him he's a point scorer and he's you know he hasn't got the record for nothing yeah. so he, he's a, he, look he's a fantastic player he is an outstanding player and um, you know if all things were even you know, and if, if nothing ha during the year, they'd love to have him involved now. Hmm. But once something's happened and you bring somebody back into the fold, surely it's going to upset the balance in the group. Is it going? Because what are you talking about? You're talking about the person coming back in rather than the next game, the next training session, the next five minutes of the training session. Um, instead of talking about the, your own team and your opposition, you're talking about the impact that this player might have hmm. when they do come into the group. So, it, it, you know, having a team focused having a team um, all tuned in, believing in clear goals, it's not easy for the manager. Yeah. And all of a sudden, if you bring in other little factors like that, y you can affect it. And um, James, has, James has done a great job. So what he's done up to now, he won't want to change. Paul, uh, you know, let's talk about the Donegal defence because last year they were much criticised. But this year they're, they're playing a more expansive game of football. But from a defensive point of view, you've been impressed with one guy in particular, haven't you? Yeah, I, I just was looking at some of the, the um, talk about both teams, but particularly Donegal and their system. And I think uh, people are probably missing the point in that they have a lot of good players. They have a lot of quality oh. players. And like a guy, one of their left lights is probably Paddy McGrath, who I've been very impressed with. And, this clip says a lot about Donegal, like, if you look at the way he practically dances up the field here, you know, with confidence, and he looks strong and he wants the ball, this could be the first minute of the game, it's actually the 68th minute, you know, and I just remember looking at that at the time thinking, that says a lot about the condition of these players, the confidence they have in what they're doing, and, you know, he's a player that I was impressed with against us, he was a player I was impressed with the last day, he's probably not that, uh, one of their less heralded players, but... You know, that's the strength of them, I think. They have a lot of... He's the guy that played with a broken jaw in the All-Ireland Under-21 final two years ago against, right? yeah. against Dublin. Two weeks mm -hmm. earlier, he broke his jaw against Tipperary and yeah, no yeah. question about him going and yeah. playing. There's a touch of character about a lot of these guys as well. His body too. language there at 68 minutes, like he, he, he wanted the ball. There aren't yeah. too many defenders that will come out of defence with that kind of confidence, like Mark O'Shea maybe would be one, but there aren't too many cornerbacks that will take a ball and dance away like that, you know, mm. at that stage of a game, you know? But he seems to epitomise a lot of what Donegal have. I, I thought last year as well, but even more this year, that each player knows what's expected of them and mm. when it's expected of them. Yeah. So if their job is to make that run in 68 minutes um, from that position, that's their job, they need to do it. If their job is to cover back for Carl Lacey when he's made a long busting run, you've got to do it. And they, there's no indecision. They know exactly what's going on, and I think that's that's a, a re like Jim McGuinness, the way that he's gotten that understanding of how to play. He's a real role model for other coaches in in the country, and um, to say like you know, if the players know their role, if they know exactly what's expected of them, that you can can you do, can achieve. Paul, having analysed both teams and and their tactics, we can see that they play a similar style of football. Who do you think, at the end of the day, in a word, is going to win this All Ireland? I have to spend a bit of time in Mayo these days, so I'll say Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Jason? Donegal. Donegal. And Colm, you're going to have the casting vote here. Casting vote is Donegal. Donegal. And there is a sense that, as time goes on near the Sunday, that, that uh, Mayo and Donegal is going to be a real thriller and packed to capacity. We look forward to, to it, and thanks, guys. Donegal is the vote of the Championship Matters panel, but just one. On Sunday, you can watch all the action from that All-Ireland Senior Football.